That was quicker than I thought. <laughs> Hang on. Let me try that again. I clicked the wrong button. Okay, let me... Okay, let me do the... Like, the a little better, right? Okay, did that work? Hello. Um, hi, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in, uh, especially if you're in DGSD 395 Applied Digital Study Section 2. That's who this stream is primarily for, but if anyone else is watching, you are welcome. And hello. Uh, it's a rainy afternoon in Fredericksburg. It's uh, not super hot, but pretty muggy because of all the rain. Uh, so I'm sitting out here in my normal space um, with my Yerba Mate, which they, you know, I get these uh, little tea bags, like it's like a tea bag of Mate, but um, used to be able to get it at Wegmans, but I, I have not been able to find it the last few times I've been at Wegmans, uh, so I'm just going to have to order another bag off the internet, I guess, but the, uh, uh, the Weg that section of Wegmans, they keep rearranging, I feel like every time I go, it's well, not every time, but I feel like they rearrange that section frequently, and so it's really hard to find things in that section, I find, because most of the things that are in that section are small, and then, um, and like how they're grouped doesn't always make sense, so I, it, it often takes me a while to find it anyway. So it's possible it's still there, and I just haven't been able to find it. Anyway, I'm just going to order another bag online. It's good. It gives me, you know, Gerba Mate. Uh, it, uh, it's like tea, but not as, doesn't taste as good. It's, it's more of a grassy, earthy kind of smell, or, or flavor, I guess. But it's got a good uh, caffeine level for me, and it's you know it's like I, I I like it. It's a nice uh, flavor. It's kind of like green tea. If you if you like green tea, you'll probably like your mate. So just my that's my endorsement for this product and uh, my mug, my love mug here today. Well, uh, good afternoon. If you are tuning in just now, um, I want to spend some time today talking first about the the node node one which is now complete and you have a copy of. And so I want to spend some time talking about that, pointing out a few things and uh, making sure you understand what to do with it. Um, how's my, it's like my audio is a little out of sync. Let me try something. Yeah, that's not too bad. You, sometimes turning the, uh, the video off and back on again will improve the synchronization. It's not a big deal anyway, but just, you know, I always like to tweak things. So uh, let's take a look. I'm, I've actually got it pulled up right here, and I've made a copy of it already. But what I would recommend you do is, if you have not already made a copy of Node 1, then make a copy uh, of your own. So uh, if you have not uh, done this, you should be able to find this in a couple of different places now. So I sent this in an announcement on, OK, I guess this is student view, but that's all right. Uh, I sent this in an announcement on, I guess Saturday. So if you click there, look at the announcement, you'll see uh, a link to the notebook there. Or from the home page on the uh, Canvas course, then you should be able to click on down here. There's a list, uh, a link to list, a link to a list of uh, all of the notebooks. Uh, there's two so far, and they're both here. But as I complete more, I will add them to this. And you can see them here. The first one was just the introduction notebook. Uh, not super important, honestly, but it's there for reference just in case you want to look at it again or find it again. And then node one is right here. And we'll be at least having um, at least four or maybe five other nodes, uh, no notebooks like this for nodes. But occasionally I might have something else or you might have something to share. So that's where all the class notebooks will be linked from. Uh, but really, you'll probably just be able to uh, like organize it in your own uh, Google Drive folder system, whatever, however that makes sense to you. Uh, so once you've made a copy of it, you should just have your own copy to reference, and you shouldn't need to come back to this index. Uh, I just thought it'd be useful to have this index page just as a, in case somebody asks me, hey, where do I find Node 1? I'd say, I could say go to the index page, and you could uh, find the link there. Um, by the way, I just thought I'd mention, in case you're curious, the origin of these images here um, on the homepage for Canvas. So Canvas doesn't let you do much as far as design, uh, like to make it your own or to really reduce the clutter of it. Uh, I feel like a lot of it is, is clutter if you're not using it. And uh, I wanted to, and I always want to, um, make it easier for you to find the things that I know are important for my class because I've designed my class. 
And sometimes I can work within the Canvas system and sometimes uh, I can't. Um, but I'm really trying to. I'm really trying to work within it. Um, I could probably clean up the sidebar actually now that I look at it in student view um, just by removing some things that I know I'm definitely not going to use for this class. Uh, but what I wanted to do on the home page is kind of have easy to find links to things that you'll need frequently. So here's a link to my Twitch stream. Um, and I just now made this a link to the Colab Notebook index. So when you click this, it takes you here to this page. Um, you can get, I, yeah, you would think I could put a link to that page in the sidebar, but uh, I cannot. Um, that's one of those limitations that Canvas has not felt uh, they should um, improve. So they, it, it is that way and it has been for a long time. Um, uh, so, but I, the images here, I just kind of picked things that sometimes related sort of to the thing that's being clicked on. So uh, the schedule, of course, that's related to time. So this picture of a clock seemed kind of appropriate. Uh, the syllabus is kind of the roadmap to the course. And so I thought a compass kind of made sense. Uh, phone for contacts, a TV for Twitch, uh, computer for, for Discord. And, and notebooks ultimately are, are about making things and working on things. So I thought maybe the sewing machine seemed like the, the closest thing. But honestly, that was pretty pretty much a stretch. Um, these, by the way, are SVG graphics, so they should scale pretty cleanly. They should look pretty good at different resolutions. Um, I've tested this on my phone. It looks okay on, on the phone. Uh, the images I got uh, here, I, let me show you where I got these from. So uh, this website, The Noun Project, I think is really useful whenever you're trying to design any kind of interaction system or anything that you want to kind of have callouts in it or images in it, um, and you're not really sure like what the best way to represent the thing is that you're trying to do. And so the noun project lets you search for any noun, like any word, and then see if there's anything that any, if any graphic designer has had a good idea for how to represent that visually. So um, oh yeah, this, this was a recent one that they featured. Um, this is, um, yeah, where is it? Statue removal, right? So um, it's a, yeah, something that's kind of relevant right now. Um, so they, these are many of these are available for uh, for free to use, um, and you you have I think you do have to create an account to get them, but uh, it's a free account that you can pay for a pro account, but a free account's fine. And what you do if you wanted to use this image, you can click on basic download, and then continue, and then you have some options. This is for free, like there's no license on this, well, there's no royalties on it, but there is a, a Creative Commons license on it. So the, the Creative Commons license is a CC BY license, which means that you can use it as long as you give credit to uh, Lewis Prado in this case. Um, oh, and this, this is kind of neat. They let you customize it, I guess. Um, okay, so you have to upgrade to Pro to, to customize it. The thing though is, uh, well, where'd it go? Okay, here, uh, Puffin. Um, if you uh, do want to, um, lose my edits. There we go. If you download it and you do want to change it, like you actually don't want this black line for this puffin, um, if you download it as an SVG graphic, uh, SVG graphics can, are, are text editable. Like if you know what you're looking at when you edit an SVG file, you can actually manipulate it all, any part of it. So that's what I did. I made those images blue for, for Canvas just to make them look a little bit more consistent with this, the style on our, our Canvas page. Um, and I also just edited the SVG to remove the, uh, the watermark. Um, but I still wanted to give credit to the person who created them, and so I did. So if you look at the homepage, that's not the homepage, um, I've given credit to uh, Lycus, Lycaus. I don't know how that person wants to, their name to be pronounced, but uh, this person, I thought, put, a, put together a pretty nice set of uh, retro technology as icons, and I thought they would be okay to use as uh, graphics for the class, so that's what I did. Um, their line looks a little thinner here, but I'm not sure if that's just because of the scale. So anyway, um, that's what I got that from, and, and it's useful in case you're ever designing something. So um, there you go, thenounproject.com, very useful. Okay, so let's take a look at the node. And um, I, uh, well, speaking of images, in the node, I used a lot of emoji to call out different sections of it. I could have used SVGs from the noun project, but it's a lot of work to get them into this notebook, and I just thought it would be easier just to use emoji. Uh, there's a lot in here, a lot of structure in here, and I thought using emoji to break it up would help it um, come across more clearly. It has certainly helped me as I've been working on it, because even though I wrote this document, I know everything that's in it, 
it's just a lot. And so navigating it is something that I find a little bit easier to do with the table of contents. So you can jump to a specific day pretty quickly in the table of contents. And that's, that's what I would recommend you use. Uh, do you, that, that's what I would recommend you do with this as well. Okay, but the first thing you should do, uh, actually two things you should do. Uh, make a copy. So if you're viewing it like this one, if you're viewing this exact document that I have here, uh, the one that you click on from the index page or from the announcement, you should go to File and then Save a Copy in Drive, and that's going to make a copy. I already did that. I'm not going to make a second one, but after you've made that copy, Google is going to call it co Copy of Node 1, blah, blah, blah. I would recommend name it, uh, rename it so it's like Zach's copy of Node 1 or Lillian's copy of Node 1 or whoever you are, um, make sure you um, use your real name or your use a name uh, that's not mine and then that way it'll be easier for me to see whose is whose and um, easier for you also to kind of tell which one is which. So that, that's, uh, that's what I recommend doing, uh, make that copy. The next thing you, you should do is edit, go ahead and edit the sharing settings on it, the access settings. This is something you'll have to do eventually before, I, before you turn it in, uh, or at least before I can see it. Might as well do it now. Uh, so, and, and this is this process is the same for every notebook to come. Uh, so, after you've made a copy, click on the share icon up here in the top right, and then choose who can access it. So, down here where it says Get Link, I've already changed the settings on this one, um, but where it, whatever yours are, if you hit Change, um, set it to anyone with the link, and then set the uh, access to comment. So, if anyone with the link can comment, that's great. Uh, that I mean, I will be the one commenting, but um, if you set it this way, anyone with a link can comment. If you don't want, it, like, if you don't want anyone else to comment on it, you don't have to send the link to them. But just uh, for me, that would help. So let me just show you that again. So you click on the sharing icon, the word share with the two people there. Go to change, and then anyone with a link is a commenter. That's what we're looking for. Uh, if you share this with me in some other way, that's not the end of the world. I'll just have to send you an email and ask you to share it the right way. And um, that's you know, it just takes time. So if you Go ahead and do it the right way now. That'll save us time later. So just a, just a thought. Uh, also related to saving us both some time, when you are ready to turn it in, let me show you this. So this is the, uh, the assignment page in Canvas. So on September 9th, which is uh, next Wednesday, that's when this one is due. And uh, we don't have class on the, the 11th because that's um, supposed to be the moving in day. We'll, we'll see. Um, but that's the idea. Uh, the, where did that go? Here it is, yeah, so um, what you'll want to do for that is, for, for turning it in, is you, again, I'm going to do the sharing thing and I'm going to get the link, so copy the sharing link, and then on the Node 1 page in Canvas, uh, when you submit it, make sure you submit it by website URL. So the, the, there's all these tabs here for submission types, and I can't turn these off. So um, file upload technically works, if you first download it as a notebook file and then re-upload it, you can do that if you want. Um, it's easier to just submit it by URL. Uh, and please do this, like just paste it in right here, you know, copy and paste, and then submit it. As you can see, there is a Google Drive option, and um, I've discovered the Google Drive option doesn't actually show anything when I'm in student mode. But if you're on, if, if you are in, in Canvas and you're looking at the assignment page, uh, you will see for Google Drive a like your a, like it'll access your your Google Drive if you've set that up and you'll be able to click on a document and submit it that way. But please do not do that. Um, please don't do that for notebooks because they don't work. Um, Canvas does not know that they don't work, so Canvas is like, hey, here's this, this notebook. But actually, what it gives me is something I can't access at all. Um, it takes me a lot of work to extract that notebook from the thing that Canvas turns it into. So please don't do it that way. Um, it's much easier if you just submit, submit by URL. Okay, sound good? Um, I just heard a little the Discord sound, so did someone have a question? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, if you do have questions about anything while I'm talking, uh, live stream chat in Discord, uh, that channel, or uh, just leave me a, a message on Twitch if you um, if you have any questions, especially especially if it's a like logistics, like how do I do this or where do I find this kind of question. All right, cool. So, uh, speaking of logistics and where to find things, let's take a look at Node 1, Living and Working with Algorithms. I'm actually going to look at my copy so I don't actually make any edits to the one that you're going to be copying from. 
And I did, do, uh, I did give you a, a preview of this on Friday, but it is now complete, so you have a lot more content here. But the same structure I showed you on Friday where you've got um, kind of introduction section and then you've got uh, for each day an agenda, some stuff to work on. And the way that I've done this with emoji is that every time there's something that you need to do, like every time I want you to do something, uh, there's a hand waving icon. So whenever you see the hand waver, like that's something for you to do. So for example, the code manifesto that's got the hand waving icon, that means you need to write something here. Um, notes for today, that's optional. Like not notes are gonna be just whatever, um, in this case anyway. Uh, but like the code practice every day, there is some code practice every day. And in some cases I have a specific prompt in the notes. Um, and so those are also given the hand waving icon. In a couple of cases, there's something that I would like for you to do with Discord. So there's a hand waving icon in the notebook, but it's directing you to go back to Discord to do something. So what you have here basically is, an, is a, uh, I think, pretty thorough um, description of class structure for the next few days of class. And it's also an interactive uh, workbook or textbook to explain some things and give you an op a place to work on and work through some things. So I hope it's helpful the way that this is all put together. That said, it is a lot. It's, it's a big document, so uh, that's why I'm spending a little time here navigating it. So let's take a look at a, a typical day. Today is a typical day in terms of how this notebook is organized. This is uh, the 31st, so uh, algorithms are the thing that we're thinking about with this notebook, and so today is a chance to think about it. Um, you have already by now read Exploratory Programming, the excerpt from Nick Montfort, uh, also the excerpt by Rushkoff in Program Review Program, or you've watched the video version of it, and I have that up here. And when we talk about that in a moment, I'm going to point out a couple things from his video, and we can talk about those. Um, so that's the pre-class stuff that you've already done, hopefully. The, then this is for today, and this is on days when I'm going to be streaming. I've got that indicated in the notes for each day. And I've also got this little icon. I don't know how well you can see it because it's pretty small, but the uh, emoji, I was pleased to discover that there's an emoji for uh, male teacher in front of chalkboard. And I thought that's close enough to me. Uh, the, I mean, this isn't a chalkboard, but the thing behind me is green. So that's sort of me. Uh, but if you look, I don't know if you can see it, it's very small on my screen, but it's uh, the, my browser anyway, renders that as a, a Caucasian male, white male, I guess, uh, with like reddish brown hair and a mustache and a tie. I think. I think he's wearing a white shirt with a red tie. So that's sort of me, I guess. Not the uh, the tie part or the hair part or the mustache part, but uh, as a male teacher in front of a, a screen, I guess that's accurate. Um, I could try to grow a mustache, you know, maybe. I'd rather not. Um, I have not. Uh, I've not had a lot of success with mustaches in my life. Uh, I have attempted it, but it just doesn't quite doesn't look right. I don't know why. Uh, it's like, like it just sort of seems to go out instead of like down. Um, so I don't know. Even when I had a beard, like there was a time in graduate school where I had a pretty, you know, pretty big beard, uh, I guess. And uh, but I always shaved the mustache part because that part always annoyed me. So I would I had sort of the Amish look going on, which I thought was pretty successful. Um, I don't know if I'm going to bring that back, but that was uh, that's what I used to do uh, with my facial hair. So now you know that. Um, if you look at my first, the book, the first book I co-edited, the uh, they have a picture of me on the. There's a picture of me on the back of that book with that beard. So if you're if you're really interested, you can track that down. There's a copy in our in the library. So anyway, um, that's what we're doing today. It's me talking on the stream as I am now, or watching. You're, you're watching me in the YouTube archive. That's fine. Um, now after class, here's some homework. Uh, there's two ways of thinking about homework. There's some stuff to do that's going to follow up on what we talked about or what I talked about now, and then there's some stuff to get ready for Wednesday, and those are related and probably something you do continuously, but um, at least me, for me mentally, it made sense to separate them. So uh, what I'd like for you to do after class today is watch this brief video uh, featuring Kathy O'Neill and listen to this brief segment of the On The Media podcast uh, also, where it's an interview with Kathy O'Neill, where she talks about the same ideas. She has a book. Um, I like to hold up books as props sometimes, but it's out of reach. It's over there. Uh, it's a book called Weapons of Math Destruction. Here, I'll, just show, I'll show you what it looks like. We oops. Weapons of Math Destruction. So, yeah, there it is. Um, 
and you see there's kind of a pun there in the title, so you know, it, I thought it would be useful to put the title on the screen there. And uh, it's good, it's, um, it's really compelling and also really clear, and I think that's what I really like about it. She has a good way of breaking down what an algorithm is. I think algorithm is one of these words that a lot of people say whenever they don't expect to have to explain what they mean. So it's the kind of thing that people just sort of throw around as though, as though we all understand or think the same thing when we hear the word algorithm. Artificial intelligence is the same way. Uh, as, a, as a term, so uh, I, but I really like the way that um, she breaks it down. Specifically, she comes up with this idea of weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs, and these are a specific kind of algorithm, a, a specific kind of predictive algorithm that she says has been harmful, and she mentions several and goes into a lot of detail about what's harmful about them, and it's really interesting. Um, some of them that I had certainly I knew about or I was aware of. Um, some that I had not really thought about as being WMDs, and uh, the one that I think was pretty striking that I had not really thought about this way before was the college ranking uh, system, the U.S. News and World Reports college rankings, which um, you probably are aware of. You probably consulted when you were choosing Mary Washington. So it's something that has a, a an outsized influence, and she calls it a WMD because it's a, uh, at least initially, I think it may have gotten better, but I think initially it was very much just a, uh, like like a closed box, like a like a black box thing that no one really is really sure how it works, but everybody was affected by the output of it, by the outcome uh, in terms of where they ranked. And so what she says is that created this kind of arms race among colleges to compete for students and use that ranking as kind of this this weapon in that arms race of competing for students. And she she argues that that um, competitive competitiveness between schools that was fueled by this essentially arbitrary ranking. Um, has led to the uh, explosion in tuition rates. Um, so she's saying that because student, because um, school presidents realize how important that ranking is, they spend a lot of money trying to improve their rankings on, on those lists, and therefore have to charge more money for tuition to get, you know, to pay for those investments that uh, are hopefully leading to a higher ranking on that list. Which, of course, is not the point of higher education. So uh, it's really. It's a it's a compelling argument in that sense. I would argue that there are more things that are that factor into the tuition rate increases that we see uh, over the last you know. And I mean, I'm not talking about small scale things, but like if you look at since like the, the year 2000 or so, like the graphs just go way way up. Um, and the, I think the competitiveness that she's talking about is part of that. I think another big part of that is uh, declining state support. So. Uh, that graph of tuition goes up like this, but state support goes like this or like this, and so um, schools have to make up the difference somehow. And unfortunately, that has to uh, comes down to tuition sometimes. So that's that's um, kind of a miniature rant from me. Sorry about that. But that's the uh, I think anyway. I think Kathy O'Neill does a great job breaking down what's wrong or what what some of the problems are, and I think that uh, it's very accessible. So uh, take a look and listen to that uh, after we're done or after I'm done streaming today. Okay, so other things for you, for you to do afterwards. Uh, there's a bit of code practice here, and uh, let me explain a couple things about how these code practice sections are written. It's essentially kind of a, like a, uh, a textbooky way of explaining how to do some code stuff, um, but not very uh, dense or deep. Uh, I'm really just kind of getting trying to get to get to some basic concepts. So work your way through it, and make sure you read what I've written. Um, don't just sort of run through and uh, run each code cell and feel like you've got it, make sure you understand what I'm, I'm asking you to do with each of these. For example, right here I'm saying change something about this. So yeah, I mean you could run it first to make sure it works, but then change something about it and see if it still works. See what difference that made when you change something about it. I, I frequently do things like that throughout these descriptions, so make sure you, you look at those carefully. There's not a lot to read, right? So make sure you read it. Um, so. This is a typo. What is this? What are those? Change the value of that. I have. I'm just sorry. I just noticed this typo. What is? What am I meaning by this? Sorry. <laughs> just like strings, numeric data can be assigned to variables, and you can operate on them by using their names. The following example creates a variable called score, assigns a number to it, and then increases that number. Okay. I just noticed this typo. Actually, I'm going to correct the original notebook so that if anyone hasn't yet made a copy of it, you will be able to have a slightly better version of it. So 
So the following example creates a variable called score, assigns a number to it, and then increases that number. Change the value that the score increases by. That's what I meant. So right now I'm increasing it by 50, so I'm saying change that number to increase by something else. That's all I meant there. Okay. <laughs> also, a couple things you should notice is um, this final cell, there's kind of a trick going on here that you may not notice until unless you read carefully. Um, it's actually not going to work, and it's a um, solvable problem. Uh, it's, but it is an error. You're going to. I have. I've written that in a way that is going to trigger a specific error, and kind of the challenge here is see if you can figure out what to do about that. I have not explained what to do about that anywhere in the notebook, so I guess my challenge is see if you can figure it out on your own. Um, there are some clues built into the error message that Python will give you. So try it, see if it makes sense, see if you can figure something out. And uh, what we'll do, hopefully, is you know, be able to talk about how you solve that problem, right? So the question here is, were you able to fix the error in the last cell? If so, what, what did you do? The point is I'm trying to help you develop strategies for solving problems like this, right? So here's something I know is a problem. I've kind of contrived this example. Um, but as you're working on your digital projects, your big projects for this class, you're going to come across things that I have no idea about. And so I want to make sure that you are being trained in how to solve your own problems. And here's one. I'm not giving you the answer. Um, well, I'll talk about the answer on Wednesday, but I'm not going to give it to you now because I want you to try to figure it out yourself. Okay. All right. Or, you know, perhaps you already know it. Like, perhaps it'll come to you pretty quickly if you just read the uh, error message. Okay, so that's basically it. Just make sure you read these things. Uh, a couple of other things, like for, for Wednesday, the other thing I'd like for you to do is take a look at uh, The Soft Truth, which is a short story by Lee Alexander. It is a, a strange short story. Uh, it is kind of like a Black Mirror episode, I would say, but in written form. And so read that, and I'm interested in hearing what you think happens at the end. So I, I would say go ahead and write that down. Sorry, let me hide this code stuff. Um, write it down before class on Wednesday, before I stream on Wednesday, so that I will ask you at some point, what do you think happens at the end of that? You'll have something already written that you could supply to the discussion. What do you think happens at the end of Soft Truth? Because it's, it's unusual. Okay, so it, all this is spelled out in the notebook, so hopefully you can kind of go through it piece by piece. But if you, if you find it confusing or if you have questions about what to do next, uh, please ask and I will try to clarify. Uh, you can ask right now on the Discord uh, channel if you're watching there, or um, other ways, of course, of uh, getting in touch. But it should all, hopefully, it's all laid out pretty clearly, step by step, uh, in order in the notebook. So check that out. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to mention or kind of ask about is in the notebook here is coming up on uh, Friday. So I just, as I've mentioned before, I'm interested in. At least one episode of Black Mirror. Um, I think a lot of the episodes are relevant to the kinds of things we're talking about in this class. A lot of them, though, are really bleak and um, unpleasant to watch, I would say. Uh, some of them, though, are uh, have a bit more of positive tone or an uplifting message. And I think this is an example. I think Hang the DJ, I think I, it has, um, I mean, I don't want to spoil the ending, but it, it definitely has a different tone than a lot of the other Black Mirror episodes I've seen. Um, it also is very relevant to the kind of things we're talking about in this opening node with algorithms. So I would like for you to watch that and then be, re be ready to talk about it in class on Friday. Uh, I mean online, you know, but in class on Friday. Uh, so the question is how to make sure everybody can have access to that. If you have a Netflix account, of course you can just watch it. Uh, if you don't, you can also sign up, you can sign up for a free trial. Um, if you have already used up a free trial, I can help you get a second one. I can show you how to do that. Um, it's a little dodgy, but it usually works. Uh, there's also, um, I don't know, there might be another way to do this with Discord, although I'm not totally confident that that's going to look okay. Like, I don't know if Discord can handle the, the, the stream rate uh, reasonably. Um, it might it might not look great. So I don't know. We, we can try that. I, I will continue to experiment with that and see what, what options may exist for me to stream the, that content to you so you don't have to have a Netflix account. But if you already do have a Netflix account or you don't mind getting one or try, getting a trial, um, go ahead and watch uh, Hang the DJ whenever, whenever you can and be ready to talk about it on Friday. I think you'll see some connections between what we've been talking about and uh, what's going on in that episode. And then I built the code examples around here sort of with 
uh, like using some character names from that episode as um, examples of what I'm trying to show you here about Python data structures. So maybe that works, maybe not. Uh, okay, great. Any questions about logistics or what to do when? Now would be a good time to ask. While I sip some yerba mate. The other nice thing about yerba mate is like, you know, if, if you have a tea bag, like regular black tea, um, it gets like bitter or weird tasting after about five minutes if you leave it steeping. But uh, not with yerba mate, you can leave it all day and it tastes fine. Well, not all day, but I mean, it, it, it doesn't turn, like it, it stays the same throughout the day, basically. It also re reheats really well, unlike uh, coffee. I feel like reheating co coffee in the microwave um, isn't great. Okay, so another little interlude there. So let's see, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we're, okay, a little longer than I hoped, but that's okay. Everyone's still out there? Are you all, are, are people watching? I haven't really seen any chatting, so I'm just kind of hoping somebody's out there. It says I have 14 viewers, so if you're out there. Yay, all right. <laughs> Someone's still there. Thanks. <laughs> you're still there. That's all I need to know. Uh, all right, great. Thanks, guys. Um, so let's talk a bit about... Um, Oh yeah, everybody's saying hi. Um, I know I, I haven't read that thing yet about the different, with the different, um, what are these called? The different uh, faces that they mean? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, e emotes, right? Is that what they're called? I haven't, I haven't actually read the whole like explanation, the glossary of what all those mean yet. So I'm still a little afraid to use them. Um, but I appreciate that some of you are. Um, the thing is like on the stream viewer thing, it's like, I can kind of, like I can't use the um, full keyboard unless I pop it out, but then when I pop it out, it resets the chat. So like whoever was just chatting, I don't have that up anymore on my full stream manager thing. Oh yeah, PogChamp. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I just put <laughs> Bob Ross in there a couple times because why not? Okay, so let's talk a bit about program or be programmed. Um, so you had two, two or three things to look at. Uh, Nick Montfort's book, and he addresses different like practical contexts and specifically academic contexts for uh, why someone would program beyond the normal sort of I want to take a class in order to be a programmer someday as a job. And I think he's got some great ideas about that, especially in terms of the humanities, which is my orientation. Like that's where I come from, uh, the, the humanities. So I, I certainly. Uh, agree with Nick about a lot of what he, a lot of what he has to say there, and uh, you know he we come from the same uh, background actually. Uh, so it's it's something that I get what he's saying. Um, it's kind of wordy though, and, and Nick can be kind of dense in the way he writes. So I think uh, in some ways um, Douglas Rushkoff's work is uh, more accessible. It's certainly very bold in what he has to say, and so I think it's something that I kind of. Uh, and might inspire a response in a, in a way that Nick Moffat's work might might not quite do. Uh, even though I don't, in in showing Rush Cup here, I want to be clear that I don't totally endorse. I don't totally agree with him. So I will go ahead and kind of preview that uh, that this is something that I think we can we can uh, disagree with in some ways. Uh, I think he has a lot of great points to say too. So I don't, I'm not saying I disagree with him. I, if I totally disagree with him, I wouldn't I wouldn't show it at all. I think there's a lot of value here. I just think I wonder if we if we have to go as far as he does. Uh, he goes pretty far here. So. Um, actually, I don't know. I know Nick, but I don't know Douglas. I, I did. Um, I can't remember why, but I, I wrote a blog entry once, and I and I I, I referred to something he had done as dumb, and uh, he actually wrote a comment saying on my blog, and he said, "I actually I'm not dumb, and here's why." I forget what it was, but it was, that was my brief interaction with Douglas Rushkoff. Um, he read my blog entry where I called him dumb, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, he has some interesting ideas here, and I think. This, I think this will work if I've got it queued up right, where if I hit play, I think you should be able to hear him talking. And uh, this did not work actually in the previous section, but I think I fixed the problem in OBS. So I think you can hear it. Uh, if not, we should be able to see the, we'll see the transcript at least. So let me try and I guess if you're watching, let me know if you hear it or not. Uh, but basically I just wanted to zoom in on one part of his talk here where I think he raises an interesting question. 
overall, the, the, the premise of this, the commandment really that he gives us here is to program or be programmed. Uh, and the, the logical con you know, consequent statement of that is if you are not a programmer, you are one of the programmed. And he's very clear on that. He insists on that a lot. But he also, I think, here raises a question that I think like, he doesn't fully answer, and that's kind of the point. Uh, he's, this is, but this is the question he's exploring, and I wonder uh, kind of what you think of this. So let's take a look and listen, hopefully, here. I wanted to figure out how much of this is the bias of the medium. In other words, that we're in a binary medium, a plus, minus, discrete, you always have to make a choice medium versus an analog reality that has many colors and different things. How much is it the bias of the medium, and how much is it the biases of the people who programmed this media for us, that who programmed our technology for us. And how do we even know which is which? How can we even tell them apart? Oh, here I am. Sorry. I forgot to unmute, uh, re unmute myself. Um, I've turned it up, but the, the issue is that I, I can't actually hear the playback on uh, this while I'm streaming. So I have to just kind of watch the audio monitor to see what it jumps around to. So uh, I, let me just play that again. It's just a, it's just a few seconds long, right? Um, I don't know if you know this, I discovered this relatively recently on a, uh, whenever you have a YouTube video with uh, a good transcript, you can actually just click to the point you're interested in. So you can click on that and it should jump to it and then um, play it back. So let's see how this sounds. I wanted to figure out how much of this is the bias of the medium. In other words, that we're in a binary medium, a plus minus discrete, you always have to make a choice medium versus an analog reality that has many colors and different things. How much is it the bias of the medium and how much is it the biases of the people who programmed this media for us, that who programmed our technology for us. And how do we even know which is which? How can we even tell them apart? So to, sum, to rephrase that, uh, hopefully you heard that a little better. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, what he's saying is, he's talking about digital technology and its relationship to everything. And he makes this grand analogy between uh, programming code, like software code, and what he calls the code of society, social code, social social software. Um, and he's saying these are the same kind of thing, not the same thing literally, but the same kind of thing. And if we are on one side of one of those, we're probably on that same side of the other one. Um, but one of his, like as he puts it here, the question is, um, is it, is the thing he's noticing, is the, the way that that goes a result of the technology itself or of the people who program that technology. And he uses the term biases here, and I wanna be clear about what he means by bias. Um, he doesn't mean, uh, and he is talking about media, so you might think he's talking about like Fox News versus MSNBC, or the fact that people covered the same story through different angles, and that reflects their uh, political bias, their ideological bias. That's not exactly what he means here, although ideology does play into what he's talking about. Uh, instead, he's thinking about something a little bit more literal than that, I think. Uh, which is that, uh, as he raises a question here, if digital technology is inherently this either or, plus minus, on off, one zero, if that's the core logic of digital technology at the fundamental you know, base level of the, uh, the hard drive, does that matter? Does that make a difference? Um, that's very different, it's a very different kind of thing than what we had before. So does that difference play out at these other levels? It might need to if we accept his analogy. If we think that society is organized in a way that's, that's similar to how software was organized, software is organized as kind of a higher level interpolation of ones and zeros. So if that's software, then, then how, does, how, is soft, how is society? Um, it, what are the ones and zeros of society, basically, would be another way to put that. So it's a very abstract argument, right? You have to really think about it and, and decide if, that, if you can kind of follow him in that trajectory. If you can follow him there, 
then I think the next set of questions become really interesting. But let's spend a little bit of time with that, that central question and let me kind of pose it to you. Uh, if you have thoughts about this, let me know in, and this probably is better for the Discord channel. You can probably see other people uh, actually from section one already attempted this as well. But let me, uh, let me pull up a question or two here. So let me just do one at a time. So his claim is that there's a difference here, but, but what do you think? Uh, does the fact that computers are fundamentally binary make a difference? Is that the bias that's inherent in the medium? And notice I said medium, not media, because I think sometimes when people say media, they hear mass media. Uh, and that's not exactly what I'm talking about, like TV, film, uh, newspaper. Uh, th those are not necessarily what we mean. I, I mean literally a way of communicating something like the internet, like a clay tablet, like sculpture. These are these are mediums. Um, and uh, even though it's kind of awkward to say that, that's usually what people in, in media studies talk about when they want to identify a group of mediums. They'll say that as opposed to media, which can be the more generic term. So what do you think? Does it matter? Did the ones and zeros uh, make a difference? And the live stream chat channel is probably a good place for your thoughts. So just, I mean, you don't have to write a whole essay about this. I'm just curious, like, does this ring true for you at all? Or uh, do you have questions? And someone's typing, so that's good. I'll give you a chance to type. I get really a lot smaller when I sit back, don't I? I do, wow. It's a big difference. I'm just looking at myself in the, in the I, like I'm watching the feed, but it's like 10 seconds behind real life for me. So I'm like, I get very small when I sit back here, but it's more comfortable. So I'll sit back here sometimes. All right. So this is certainly the, the kind of class where, I mean, the kind of discussion normally like in a class, I would probably like have you all uh, ask, uh, talk about this at your table, or do some, you know, maybe a general conversation. Um, so this is me posing the question on the stream, and then seeing if you have any responses that you can add in the uh, in the chat. Um, so far, just one person is typing. So hopefully, everyone else is still thinking. I do want to kind of hear your ideas. So. Uh, and this, by the way, if you don't if you don't get it together or don't have any thoughts yet, um, you can expand on this in your node. So, like, go into your node in the notes for today, and then expand on what you think in terms of this question of bias. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> interesting speculation there. Okay, from uh, Hum. So. You do raise a question that if, if the binary gets superseded by something else, like in quantum computing, uh, where we have uh, superposition of particles as uh, the core logic of it, I believe with that you end up with four or more different possible values for every bit of it, or it's like a, not a bit, but it's like a quantum bit, whatever that is. Um, yeah, maybe our method, our analogies could should change. Um, I don't know, uh, but you're right. I mean, maybe this could be the, the binary could be more evident later on. Um, to think of it another way, when we're talking about algorithms here, algorithms ultimately are, uh, and this is going. This is a paraphrase of Kathy O'Neill, but she says algorithms are opinions formalized in code. And what happens when you formalize something in code? Uh, you say it's going to be this way or this way. It's going to have this. This particular value is going to have this particular consequence. And you kind of can't, I mean, you can program different things for something to consider, but if you're talking about a decision, it's going to be either one or the other. And that ultimately is the kind of logical progression that a computer can do, that, that programming can do. Um, so that might be another way of thinking about either or. So the one and zero that encodes data is a little hard to get to, and really we don't deal with it that way, right? The computer does that on its own. Uh, it encodes the data for us. And what we do is we write a word or we sing a song or we do something that we can perceive as a song or as a word later on. So and to me, I'm not sure that the binary thing totally is visible in our interactions with it, except that computers are logical systems. And this isn't the binary in terms of the, the data, but in terms of the uh, structure. So we're, we're going to be writing code. And as you'll see when you try to write code, co computers are not good at ambiguity, like nuance. 
context. These are things that computers just cannot do. And we have to be very specific and very clear whenever we want a computer to do something. Um, that's going to be true at the level of writing code. Uh, it's also going to be the, true at the level of designing software to solve a problem uh, where the code might be trivial at that point. The, the decisions, the design is still going to have the same need to be precise and we need to make sure that we are uh, asking the computer what we think we're asking the computer so when we get the answer we'll believe the answer and that's sort of that's sort of the hard thing when you get to uh, get to programming uh, there's a really good book about that by the way uh, about that particular problem called uh, you look like a thing and i love you by janelle shane uh, it's, it's all about sort of the problems or the weirdness of ai which is uh, her term for that and i, I really i recommend that book uh, highly uh, okay, so here's just a final question, and then we'll wrap things up. So if the command bit is to program or be programmed, uh, who currently are the programmers? And you can run with this in the analogy if you'd like. Like if, if it's analogies that society is being run like software, who are the programmers of, of society? So again, I'll pose this question, invite anyone who feels inspired to put something in the chat. That would be great to hear your thoughts. What do you think? Someone typing, that's great. That is kind of nice about Discord. I can see when someone's typing, you know. <laughs> Two people typing, great, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I think next time I do want to have more of a conversation. I think uh, this, like the setup I have right now, me talking and then you all typing isn't, isn't great for conversation, obviously. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll try the uh, voice chat or smaller group chats in Discord. Um, so, like, as you all are typing, let me give you kind of another, like, a hint or another way to think about this. Near the end of his talk, he extends his idea to talk about how technology has played out in different uh, generations of technology. And I think it's a really, it's a, it's a simplification, sure, but I like the simplification of it, where he says, the technology of the alphabet, it exists. He doesn't go into why it exists or where it comes from, but... We have the technology of the alphabet, so that gives us the ability to read. But it doesn't give us the ability to read. It gives some people the ability to read, but it creates a society of listeners. So we have readers, the priests, who stand in the square and read the Torah, and then we have uh, the, the the village comes around and listens. And they so we have a society that's organized around that sort of reading and listening structure. So the readers are like the programmers in our analogy. The next phase is the printing press. So for the printing press. Um, we have the more people have the ability to to uh, write now and so we have writers but really most people are not writers they're readers so now readers have inherited the ability that let the priests be the priest in the previous generation now everyone has that and so there's a new upper class if you will a new programmer class that are now the writers so people who can write and publish have access to uh, you know, have the time to sit down and write something, have access to a publisher to get it published. Those are the people whose ideas have an influence, and they are the priests to the programmers. So now we have programming, we have the internet, and so we have, uh, but we don't have a, a culture of programmers, we have a culture of bloggers, as he says. So we, we write in the box that Google gives us, uh, which I think is really a, a kind of a sad way to put it, but it kind of makes sense that we are, you know, we are not a nation or civilization of programmers, we're a nation of, or civilization of, of writers, um, which is good. Writing is good. Writing can be a pathway to power and, and influence, uh, but he's saying that there's still another level that we don't have access to yet. Yeah, so um, I think what, what you're getting at home there is that this is, I mean, it's an analogy for Douglas Ruskoff, but it also is literally true, too, as we'll see, especially with the things that we're looking at for, for Wednesday that uh, the decisions you make, that you think you're making, have already been made or delimited for you by the designers of the software that you use. So, yeah. Right, and as, as uh, Jesse Bear points out, you, um, I mean, it's not like this is just something that we are, uh, we can opt out of, that we can just be like, well, you know, I don't use, I don't use the internet. <laughs> I have had students tell me that they, they aren't computer people or they don't use computers. But they, but you, you do. Like you can't not use computers, even if you don't actually own one. 
I mean, your car is a computer. Uh, the registrar is using a computer to put you in different classes. Like you, you can't not come into contact with computers. Like you just, you literally can't. So um, what we have to decide is what we do with our relationship to these things. And um, the more we know about them, the better, right? That's my, my basic take on it. The more you know about your car and the computer in your car, the more you can fix it. Like right now my car, um, I've been working on my car a lot and my car is kind of old, it's 2002. It, Whenever it has an error code, it just it just tells me check engine light comes on. That's all I can see. Newer cars, they'll sometimes, I think, actually tell you what the error code is in the little dashboard information system, um, but I don't have that. Uh, but even then, like like with my thing, you can get the reader to read out the code, but then you have to be able to interpret the code. Like, I, have to, I have to actually understand, like, okay, the O2 sensor is off, so does that mean the sensor is broken or that there's a problem with my, uh, you know, my air intake hose? Uh, uh, you know, so there's ways in which you still have to do it. But if you are the person who has access to that code of the car, you're the one who can influence what gets done to it. So I take it to my the place I get stuff done. I trust them, but at the same time, they can read that code and interpret it. And then I kind of have to in, uh, trust their interpretation. But I, you know, the more I learn about those codes and learn about how to solve and how to interpret those and work those towards a solution, the more. Uh, control I have over my car and also the less money I spend because it's it's expensive to get your car fixed over and over again so I'm doing it myself a lot more and it's, it's fun it's, it's fun and it's also saving me money so I'm learning a lot on YouTube so <laughs> uh, but I also I have to it's still a lot of work so my car is up on jacks right now because uh, I need to replace the motor mount and um, I did replace it or I, tried, I got the motor mount then I found a much much cheaper one I bought the I bought one from AutoZone it was one hundred and thirty dollars, and I was like, okay, I guess so. But then I found a, I found one for twenty five dollars on another website, so I returned the one to AutoZone. I'm gonna get the cheaper one. Uh, it'll, it's probably fine. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we start out right. So then this is the idea. Um, we we have to move as Arrow Twitch Seven Nine is pointing out. We have to move beyond that blind sponge. I like that that idea of a blind sponge. I don't know if you mean like, like literally like a, the cleaning implement or like the animal in the ocean that just sort of you know, filters everything that goes by it. But in both cases, yeah, we got to move beyond that. Um, and, and actually, yeah, as, as Jay Probst points out, um, I, by the way, I'm, I'm using your Discord names. I know who you, what your real names are, but, I, but I'm respecting your, your Discord names here. Um, this is even more important now when we're most of our, like even more of our actions and interactions are mediated and the things that we can do or not do are very much influenced by the platforms we use for that. Um, so I, I mean, I've chosen Discord and Twitch as our main platforms, the ones I'm using right now. Um, but I did that thoughtfully. I mean, I, there, there are ways in which I could do the pretty much exactly the same thing on, on YouTube. I, you know, I have mixed feelings about YouTube. I like it a lot, but as we'll see with the readings for Wednesday, there are some reasons to be concerned about YouTube just generally. And so, um, you know, I like having multiple platforms, basically. I like to spread things out uh, personally, and then also pedagogically, I, I hope to introduce you to multiple platforms that you can choose to embrace or or not, but just knowing that they exist is useful. Anyway, I need to wrap this up. I've been going a little bit long. Let me just remind you about what's going on and what you need to do to prepare for, uh, for Wednesday. So let me see, I'm gonna jump to Wednesday. Again, read The Soft Truth by Lee Alexander and think about the ending. Write what you think happens in your notes for Wednesday and then be prepared with that on uh, for our discussion. I might do like a breakout room thing in Discord for that discussion just to kind of you know give more people a chance to uh, chat with each other. Um, also in Discord, just as a kind of topic to talk about, um, the thing that comes up in The Soft Truth and uh, in this article from New York Times and some other things is the, uh, the YouTube recommendation algorithm. So I'm just curious if you've ever had any experiences with the algorithm where you were aware of the algorithm. Uh, so uh, like any particularly weird or particularly unexpectedly, uh, surprisingly appropriate things, like things that you didn't know you would be interested in, but YouTube says, here it is. And in fact, it's brilliant and you love it. Like, are there any experiences like that that you can share? Um, either good or bad. And uh, just of course, make sure it's appropriate to share. If it's not, if it's something too disturbing or weird, then let's leave that off. Hey. Yeah, I'm just I'm wrapping it up. All right, so I got it. I'm going to wrap this up. Sorry, I went a little bit long, but it is time for karate. So I've got to go take my daughter to karate. Uh, they'll probably be I don't know. They've been doing it outside. I don't know if they can do that now. But anyway, 
Uh, I gotta wrap it up, but thanks for watching. I'll upload this and put it online later, but make sure you look through the notebook to see what you need to do to be ready for uh, Wednesday. If you have any questions, let me know. See you later. Bye.